Hello, everyone. Uh, great to see you today. Uh, my name's Leanne. I'm on the leadership team, and I also get the unique pleasure of being married to Steve Vaughan, <laughs> pastor, uh, who's uh, also speaking to us today. Uh, we uh, have a one hour service. It's going to be action packed. We are uh, continuing our series on Acts, uh, looking at how God equips his people. And uh, isn't it amazing? I think it's great just to be reminded that not only is God God, but he is involved in our lives and he is equipping us and guiding us. Um, as well as all the usual fun and games as well, we have Audrey, who's going to be sharing a, a short reflective piece with us. And, and also, last but not least, we're saying a fond farewell to our dear friends, uh, Ben and Yvonne, who are moving back to Germany. And uh, this provides me a seamless segue introducing, in introducing who is on the welcome team serving today, which is indeed Ben. Hello. Yeah. So, yeah, for the last time, uh, I have the pleasure today to welcome you. Um, if you're new, you probably don't know me and I don't know you, but welcome, um, especially, and everyone else. Yeah, welcome as well. So um, if you're new, I might drop you a message. And if you have any questions about our church, um, about the service, about how to get connected, um, feel free to uh, ping me, just try, uh, select in the chat. Um, ben and Yvonne is dropped down and then you can send me a private message and ask uh, all the questions you want. And now I'm handing over to Mephi to the call of worship. Hey everyone, good afternoon. Uh, let, let's take a moment to, to focus on our hearts or our hearts in God this afternoon. Just wherever you're at, perhaps you felt, felt really close to God this week. Perhaps you, you felt super far from him. And perhaps you, you've distanced yourself from him and, and you don't feel worthy of following him. There's so many things that rob us of joy. But to each one of us, God beckons us to come. So we have a moment now where we can intentionally seek him, where we can intentionally uh, hit reset and fix our gaze back upon him again. Will you read with me Psalm 90 verse 14? says, satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. You know, for some, we're, we're going to sing now as a declaration that we're satisfied in God alone. And for others, we're, we're, we're going to sing out of desperation that despite trying everything else during the week, we're saying, God, we're coming back to you. And so wherever you're at, I, I, I'd encourage you just close your eyes. And will you join with me in prayer with where you're at, just saying, God, I want to be satisfied in you and you alone. Lord, I, I thank you that you receive each of us just as we are. That no matter what we do, that no, no matter what kind of performance we try to put on, you receive us just as we are. Father, I pray that you would renew our desires, you would renew our affections, that they may be toward you and not towards the, the, the things the world has to offer. So I pray this afternoon that you would satisfy us in your presence, that that would be enough. And so may we be a people who will sing for joy now, at despite circumstances and, and despite having many good reasons not to sing, we are declaring before you that you are God and we find our joy and our deepest satisfaction in you and you alone. Amen. Forgiven in Christ's life, 
we are the risen and he shall come again praise the king praise the king we're going to sing that first verse again this is a new song to us we're going to sing upon a hill upon a hill a perfect savior upon that day the greatest love the punishment should have fallen on us upon him upon him I sing Christ has died Christ had died we are forgiven and Christ alive we are the risen and he shall come again praise the king praise the king upon our hearts upon our hearts his name is written king of kings lord of hosts pouring out song of praise burden and of sin and of guilt could be taken away and that we could have a fresh slate. We thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us and we praise you. We give our thanks and our praise to you. We, we put that upon you uh, as a thank you for what you have done. So thank you Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Uh, I'm going to, uh, Audrey's now going to share this uh, reflective piece with us. Really looking forward to this. Um, hello. Yes, so I'm Audrey. Um, I'm one of the student interns and I first arrived in Dublin last September. I previously studied classics at Western University in Canada, but I now study English literature and French at Trinity. So some of you might have read my blog on finding community in lockdown, and today I'll share a little bit more of that story. When I initially decided to move to Dublin, I felt self-assured and self-sufficient. After all, I've moved 14 times before, and I've lived away from my parents for a few years now. I was also very pleased with lockdown restrictions because I believed that making friends would damage my academic performance. Yet after only a few months of my new life had passed, I realized that I was intensely lonely. It already felt like everything had gone wrong. I had an abundance of housemate issues, bouts of insomnia, and I had begun to relapse into an eating disorder. I made a few friends at college, but we didn't really connect over Zoom, and I was too proud to tell them that I was struggling. A family friend advised that I seek help from a local church, but I didn't take her advice. I grew up in the church and I'd had many experiences with religious hypocrisy. I often told people that although I loved God, I hated organized religion. I read my Bible and prayed regularly, but I viewed church going Christians with contempt and disdain. After a few more weeks of misery and isolation, I decided to give CCC's virtual service a try. I was very suspicious at first, but as various people sought to know and genuinely care for me, I realized that you weren't just trying to recruit or indoctrinate me. God used the church to remind me that he created us to love and to be loved, not only by himself, but by others. I'd always thought that God would somehow be pleased by my self-exile, my self-denial of relationships, but nothing could be further from the truth. Though I don't know many of you, you are my brothers and sisters in Christ, and he calls us to support one another. That being said, if you're feeling isolated, of course I would encourage you to message the welcome team or to email someone like myself on staff. But I would also say that we need to remember our greatest friend, God himself. In my loneliest moments, I was comforted by verses like Isaiah 41, eight, which says, but you Israel are my servant, Jacob whom I have chosen, the descendants of, my, of Abraham, my friend. As I wrote in the blog, I'd always viewed my need for community as weakness. And in this sense, it's true. I am weak. I was never designed to be self-sufficient. I wholeheartedly thank God for that because through my fragility, he uses his family to draw me nearer to himself. I'm so grateful to have the privilege to serve you and to serve alongside you as a student intern. So if there's anything that you remember from my spiel, I hope it's this. That when we commit ourselves to our communities, we have the divine opportunity to love one another in the way that Christ first loved us. So thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me a message. And Andrew is now going to lead us in prayer. Um, let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we come before you today and thank you for the opportunity to continue meeting as a church and as a community. I thank you for, for Audrey and her story that she shared and her vulnerability. I thank you for helping her to discover that community during lockdown and the understanding that we are brothers and sisters in Christ and members of your household. And I just want to lift, lift up the current sermon series of surprising power to you, Lord. And thank you for these incredible individuals who show power, resilience and obedience, often through incredible adversity. I pray that we can learn to be more like these individuals of Stephen and Philip and worship you and give you adoration and thanksgiving throughout our daily lives. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray that we may be able to continue to grow in our faith and community through this pandemic. We trust you and pray for those facing a difficult personal situation through COVID-19 and continue to pray for the easing of restrictions and renewed gatherings together as well. We lift this up in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, thank you so much, Audrey, as well, for sharing, uh, like Andrew prayed, so vulnerably. That was really encouraging and inspiring. So thank you. Um, so uh, onto the icebreaker. 
we uh, I've been thinking about this theme of uh, God um, you know equipping us uh, in times you know in the moment and so uh, I was thinking about all those times when uh, I felt you know totally in the deep end totally overwhelmed not knowing what to do and uh, and I was thinking wouldn't it be great to do a good old multiple choice would you rather poll <laughs> so we've got a poll coming up and it's uh, various uh, uncomfortable for most situations and you get to choose which one you would rather do in that scenario um i shared these with mappy earlier and he said that his palms got sweaty as he was thinking about them so <laughs> that'll give you a bit of a clue uh, and also maria who's going to be doing the news with me in a minute is going to be uh, helping me as we look at all your answers so do fill in your poll and uh, and uh, we'll have a look at your answers in a minute The suspense. <laughs> I know, it's like we need a drum roll or something, some <laughs> action music going on, you know, like game show music. Oh, sea swimming, coming out on top. I can't even see the bottom ones yet. Oh yeah, I can, oh yeah. So uh, yeah, the, I would totally take gloves over sea swimming in January. I mean, seriously. Ooh, mad um, fight between South Pole and desert. <laughs> You know, as well, I cannot understand how more people would prefer to be in a submarine than a hot air balloon. OK, it's actually changing now, but the submarine idea actually gives me palpitations thinking about it. Which one was uh, which one would be uh, the trickiest decision for you, Maria? I don't know if I'd rather be cold every day in January or have my fingertips cold every day for a year. <laughs> oh, that's that, that one's a nail biter. I don't know if I would do. How about you, Leanne? Yeah, the, the toughest one for me is the back in time or back in future uh, or into the future. But I think better the devil you know than the devil you don't. So I'd probably lump for the in the past, but... Uh, but uh, yeah, it, that is a tricky one. That is a tricky one. And obviously you need to have a time machine. So the Macarena is coming out clearly on top for the uh, public show. And yes, the 74% sea swimming over fingerless gloves, obviously um, not willing to take the fashion, uh, fashion step that is fingerless gloves. Although Steve says, it's just in, we can choose both, we can choose both of those options. Yeah, so who who wouldn't, I mean, it's so tough to decide, yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, having cold fingertips, I never said you couldn't wear gloves on top. So maybe, yeah, maybe I didn't specify that, maybe I should. Beat the system. Yeah, yeah, I want to know who these 14 people are who would do a lip sync on the Late Late Show. <laughs> Who are they? Because I think we should write in and tell them. We've got some, uh, we've got some talent coming on, um, Brian. Who's going to do it? Let us not divide what God has united. <laughs> okay. Huh? okay, okay. Well, that is uh, wonderful. Thanks, everyone, for taking part in that. Um, the, here are the overall results yet. So overall winners are Hot Air Balloon, thankfully. Which one would have yours been in that one, Maria? Ooh, I would be hot air balloon. See the views, enjoy yeah. the air in your lungs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as long as you don't go too high up. Um, desert or South Pole? Desert, I think. I'd like to get the suntan rather oh, than lose oh. my fingers, you know? Yeah, I, I'm a South Pole person now. I, I sort of freak out about the lack of water. Um, <laughs> back in time, uh, Macarena or lip sync? I think the macarena with teenagers would be so fun. Yeah. Oh, I think that'd be hilarious. How about yeah. you? Yeah, macarena for me too. That was great. Okay, well, thanks everyone for that. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it got you thinking about some um, key moments, uh, key choices that you might be facing in your life. Um, so first piece of news that I've got for you. We are sadly saying goodbye to Ben and Yvonne. They've been in Dublin uh, and part of CCC for six years. Um, they have served faithfully in the welcome team. They did a stint as city group leaders uh, that, and they've just genuinely just been stuck in and involved and it's been such a you know, great part of the family uh, at CCC. So we're really gonna miss you guys. We um, have a Zoom 
uh, sort of chance, uh, a separate Zoom, so you'd need to log out of this one at the end of the service, not now, and join in to uh, that Zoom. Uh, later. We'll share that again later on. Um, so we can actually say goodbye and uh, speak to them and some people will share and they'll also share a bit about what they're moving on to. But we, um, we wish you all the, bless all the best, every blessing for you guys as you head on. Great. And then it's the first Wednesday of May, if you can believe that already. But that means that we get to do a prayer and worship night this Wednesday. Um, so good time to come along. A lot of things I know are changing with lockdowns and restrictions lifting. So it's a good time to just center yourself and come along. And also, we're going to be putting in the chat um, some prayer requests and invite you guys to join the leaders and the staff team and fasting on Wednesday as we pray for some things about the future, restrictions being lifted, and what the summer holds. Um, so do come along on Wednesday. And if you're able, fast with us and pray with us as well. Um, we also have coming in next weekend um, a part two of our series on navigating the housing crises which started as a one-off, but then it was such a good conversation um, of just the challenging of housing in Dublin, what that looks like, how we should do this in the future, how do we build roots, but also make sure we're center and next to community. So many questions and um, the conversation was so good that we're actually having a second round next week. If you didn't go to the first round, you can still come to the next round. They're both standalone, but it's just the same conversation. And this time we're actually having our expert on the housing in Dublin, Justin Anderson, come talk to us and share us some options and his thoughts from his work and working in that space. So come along next weekend right after the service um, for this seminar. Brilliant. And finally, um, I'm sure, oh, sorry, can we move on to, uh, I don't think we're gonna, yeah, thanks. The in-person service, I'm sure you've heard or that the restrictions are changing in the next few weeks. We're gonna be able to meet in person uh, from the 16th of May. So that's the first one that we're gonna have. It's gonna be a hybrid, so we're gonna have obviously online and in person. The usual uh, restrictions as we had before, so 50 people, we're gonna have sign-ups beforehand, you know, all the sort of relevant safety precautions, um, you know, put in place, and you can read about those on our website if you want to know them in more detail. Um, the key thing at this stage is that we are organizing rotors, uh, both for the in-person and online, because they obviously both require various, um, people serving. So please, uh, can you share your availability with your team leaders if you're already on a team or get in touch with uh, Vanessa if you uh, are not and would like to be. Um, and also, could you, uh, it would just be really helpful at this stage if you could uh, consider your summer plans. It looks like we're gonna be a little bit thin on the ground potentially. Uh, so just to consider when and how you might be able to serve as well over the summer. Um, so. Advanced planning is super helpful in all of these things. So yeah, I would really appreciate it if you uh, got back to us on all of that stuff. Great, okay, well, we're gonna move on to the next part of our service now. And Connor is going to uh, do our reading for us today in Acts. Thanks, Neil. It's a long passage, so uh, bear with me. Um, from Acts 8, um, chapter, chapter 8, verses four to eight, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went philip went down to a city in samaria and proclaimed the messiah there when the crowds heard philip and saw the signs he performed they all pay, paid close attention to what he said for with shrieks impure spirits came out of many and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed so there was great joy in that city and then jumping to verse 26 now an angel of the lord said to philip Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he made an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of it, all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a, a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. 
In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and tells him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared as as a Tius and uh, travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So now I'll just pray for Steve before we before he speaks to us. Father God, thank you for your word and what we can learn through it. I pray that you speak to us and speak through Steve um, as we prepare to hear from your word. Um, in your name, I pray. Amen. 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 Lovely to be with you. And you're all welcome to put on those fingerless gloves and come see swimming with me in January. Uh, that would be a pleasure rather than a would you rather. Uh, if I haven't met you, nice to uh, semi meet you and hopefully we'll get to meet each other soon on the 16th of May onwards will be physical services. So looking forward uh, to that. A desire that I think is common to all people, certainly to me, I, I wonder if it's a desire that you have, is a desire to be useful. Um, I think we, we all want to be useful, don't we? We want to we make a difference. Growing up and still to this day, I avidly enjoy and read uh, many biographies of Christians in the past who have been used, been useful, made a difference for God. Martin Luther, Corrie ten Boom, George Whitfield, Brother Andrew, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, Charles Spurgeon, John Stott, the list goes, I just love them. I've got three more that I've just recently ordered. I'm going to read. I long to be useful to God. I wonder, do you long to be useful to him too? One of the great joys when you read the book of Acts, the, the account of the early church after Jesus ascended to heaven, is that it is clear that God wants and plans for everyone to be useful. His mission, his church, and his plans for this world involve all Christians, not just special Christians, not just elite Christians, whatever that might mean, not just paid Christians, not just well-educated, theologically learned Christians. All Christians are to be used by God. And today we get to consider one of those ordinary Christians. We've looked at Stephen. He, was just, he wasn't an apostle. We've now looking at Philip. He wasn't an apostle, just an ordinary Christian. And Philip was mightily used by God to reach the Samaritans and this Ethiopian eunuch. And the key to what I want to say today is the reason Philip was used by God was that he was available to God. We cannot be useful to God if we're not available to God. So Philip teaches us what it is to be available. And available and useful for what, you might ask? If I'm going to be used, how might I be used? If, if I'm making myself available, how might God use my availability? The reason Philip was greatly used is that the Holy Spirit empowered him for evangelism. To make known the gospel, the good news of Jesus to non-believers. And that's what God has for all of us. He wants to use us in evangelism. Every Christian. I know we have different personalities, gifts and temperaments. I know. I know some of you have had bad experiences of evangelism on the receiving end of it or trying to give it, as it could say. I know we need to define what evangelism is and maybe more importantly, what it isn't. I know we need to be culturally sensitive and consider the best way to evangelize. In fact, today we're going to look at that. I know our culture tells us to keep the truth to ourselves and not to proselytize others. I know. I know that some of you and me too, because of our culture, stance on Christianity, it can be scary to evangelize and open our mouths and speak about Jesus, or we might be rejected, or we might sort of not know what to say when the tricky question comes. I know, I know, I know, I feel it. I feel it, do you? I know. But the Bible says, Jesus says this at the start of the book of Acts, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God's plan for his church, for all Christians, followers of Jesus, is that we would be sharers of the gospel with those that don't know Jesus. Philip gives us a great example of what it means to be available to God to be used in evangelism. So here's my message. Here's the message that the Holy Spirit wants to give us. The Holy Spirit wants to give us power to be available, point one, ready, point two, to be used by God for evangelism, point three. Now, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, and this is why you're not a follower, because Christians go around telling everyone and you're a bit put off by that. Well, firstly, thanks for coming. That's gutsy of you. I really appreciate it. Secondly, I actually think this is the message you need to hear. For, for, here's the reason. Everyone is doing evangelism in our culture. It's not just Christians who try to evangelize. Everyone's evangel in other words, everyone's trying to say, uh, this is the truth you should believe. So when our culture tells us Christians, you shouldn't proselytize us, they are proselytizing us by telling us what we should and shouldn't do. Do you see? Everyone does evangelism. You can't avoid it. Everyone's trying to persuade everyone else of what's right and wrong and how to live their lives. The fact that Christians are told to shut up is the culture evangelizing us. So we've got to think, well, what does it mean to do evangelism? And this is the, the, the Christian view with gentleness and respect. And why, what message do we have that we think our culture needs to hear? So if you're here today, you don't follow Jesus, and you might find the word evangelism offensive, I hope today will help you. Stay with me to the end and then get in contact if you did still find it offensive. Okay, let's look at the three things. First of all, Philip was available. To be available means to be flexible, to be open, to be willing. Now, it's remarkable how available Philip was. Philip was available in adverse circumstances. The reason Philip ends up in Samaria from Jerusalem is persecution. Stephen is killed, and as, as he's killed, a great persecution breaks out in the early church. And what happens is they have to scatter, and so Stephen is part of the scattering. And what do we read? Those who'd been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed, proclaimed the Messiah there. So God uses adverse circumstances to spread the gospel. Question, brothers and sisters, are any of us facing adverse circumstances right now? Are any of us having to learn to react and hold plans loosely and give up some of our plans and figure it all out again? Yeah, we all are. COVID-19. Philip actually didn't have time to consider. He was just scattered. It was persecution. It was just react. This, was, this wasn't planned or chosen or deliberate. This was things outside of his control moved him on. And how did he react? Navel gazing, self-pity, anger, disbelief? No. Whenever there's adverse circumstances, this is an opportunity God is giving us to share the gospel. That's how Philip thought. As one door closes, God was always opening many other doors. God's activity on earth, his mission to reach the nations with the gospel has not been stopped because of COVID-19. Of course, some doors have shut and we look for hopefully some of them to be opening soon enough. But as some doors have shut, other doors have opened. Let's be flexible. Let's continue to be flexible and available. I wonder about you then. Even now, this week, this month, how might God be using the challenges, the adversity, the situations beyond your control, the adverse circumstances, to open doors for you to share the gospel. Philip was available. Secondly, Philip was available to the ministry of angels. Look at verse 26, 27. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go to the road, the desert road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. Gaza. So he started out. Do you believe in angels? I hope you do. Many people today are so sophisticated that they don't believe in angels is what they think. If you take the Bible seriously, you become very aware that there's an invisible realm that is peopled by intelligences. Some are fallen and are therefore conspirators with Satan, but multitudes are servants of the Lord God Almighty and probably have much more to do with our lives than we realize, protecting us, guiding us, providing for us. What do angels tell us about evangelism? That it's a spiritual battle that we're engaged with. If you want to be available to God and useful for evangelism, be prepared for the spiritual battle and persecution. Be aware and discerning, but be encouraged. The angels are there guarding you, protecting you. Every time the word of God spreads in the book of Acts, persecution heats up. 
The devil and his demons prowl around trying to find ways to shut the Christians up so they wouldn't speak. They try to intimidate the Christians. Be encouraged. The angels are there with you and they're going to help you. Be open. Be available. Be aware. Philip was not only available in adverse circumstances through the ministry of angels, he was also available through the Spirit's prompting. Look at verse 29. The Spirit told Philip, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. What did it look like for the Spirit to tell Philip? We don't know. Luke doesn't tell us what it looked like. Was it an audible voice? Was it inner conscience? Was it an inward compulsion? Was there an inner voice? We don't know, and and nor do we need to be dogmatic and pretend we know exactly what it meant for the Spirit to tell Philip. All the suggestions that I just mentioned, I think, are possible, and we need to be open to them all. So we must be sensitive. How is the Holy Spirit nudging and prompting you towards people in your circle or maybe outside of your circle to share the gospel? This week, be aware. Is the Spirit nudging me towards that person? Can I drop a message to that person? So on and so forth. So Philip was available to God through adverse circumstances, the ministry of angels, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. There's more. Philip was available. In other words, he was in, in that he was prepared for inconvenience. You see, the angel or, or, tells, uh, tells Philip uh, to, to, uh, to take a 60 mile journey from the bustling city of Samaria to a desert. 60 miles to a desert. That is inconvenient. If you're going to be available and ready to be used by God to share the gospel, we must be prepared to be inconvenienced. Stopping what we're doing, visiting unpleasant surroundings, receiving text messages in the middle of the night, making those tiring and sometimes fruitless journeys or trying to have the conversations or meet with a friend for... You, you know, you just have to keep going. I'm willing to be inconvenienced. Say no to a nice social thing so I can go and be with a friend or I know needs help. Whatever it is. Are you willing to be inconvenienced so you can be used? And fifthly, this is brilliant. Philip was available in that he was available to be used by God to reach just one person. Many of us like the idea of crowds and miracles and buzz and the drama of Samaria. That's what Matthew took took us through last week. But are we prepared for the desert for one person? And for the anonymity of it all, just one person. Are you available to be taken away from a vibrant ministry, away from the limelight, to be used by one person that no one else sees? Can God God take you in a ministry sense from a city to a desert? You see, there's no pride in Philip. Pride gets in the way of availability and therefore evangelism. Philip's given up his rights. When he came to Christ. So he says to God, you can use me however you want. I'm here to be used. Are you humble enough to be that available? Or have you told God, no, 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 God, this is the kind of ministry I must have if you're going to use me. No, no, no. God, use me as you will. One person in a desert, I'll go. So Philip was available in adverse circumstances to the ministry of angels, the prompting of the spirit for inconvenience, for just one person. Now, why was he available? He was available because he was ready. And when I say ready, I'm talking about readiness in terms of focus and conviction around the importance of the gospel. So when God leads Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip is ready to share the message because he's personally convicted in its power to save as it saved him. Philip's life had a focus. He's, his life was lined up to the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. He, Philip's life had a compass that was lined up with God's compass. That the gospel must go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And that focus, that conviction in the gospel, that readiness meant that Philip was able to overcome prejudice, nerves and embarrassment when it came to sharing the gospel. Think about them. He put aside personal prejudice, whether ethnic or racial. This man, this Ethiopian eunuch, was most likely a black man uh, from the continent of Africa. The Samaritans who Philip had been reaching before, well, at least they were kind of half Jews. This man was 100% Gentile. If Philip had any prejudice, he overcame it because he was convicted in the gospel. He was ready. 
He put aside personal nerves. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, Phillips a nobody in the desert. I mean, just a nobody, a one on his own, lost in a desert by himself with no prestige. No one knows him. And he encounters like a royal official of the Ethiopian queen. Wow, like he could have been intimidated by the person's status. Like, oh, this person's a social status, a few above me. Like this person's got all these big harem or not harem, I should say all the pomp of, of you know, the, the queen's travel. And he wasn't intimidated. Or if he was, he overcame those nerves to share the gospel ac across class boundaries upwards, which can be as hard as sharing the gospel across class boundaries in the other direction, you could say. And he put aside personal embarrassment. The Old Testament forbade eunuchs from entering the temple and Jews had been taught from time memorial to have a great distaste for any kind of sexual mutilation. Circumcision as a Jew reinforced, and Philip would have been circumcised, reinforced the value of the male genitalia. It was key to obeying God's commands to procreate, fill the earth and be numerous. So Philip, a circumcised Jew, may have had a natural awkwardness to how he was going to handle the eunuch. But he overcame this. It's amazing, really, isn't it? In God's providence, the man was reading Isaiah 53, the book of the Old Testament. Why? Well, maybe he'd been to Jerusalem for one of the festivals and was coming from it. And in Jerusalem, he'd stumbled across Isaiah 56. In an Isaiah 56, it talks about a new day, a new covenant that's going to come. And what does it say in Isaiah 56 to eunuchs? For this is what the Lord says to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath, who chooses what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I'll give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. Maybe the eunuch in Jerusalem at a festival had been so astounded that he was personally addressed by the God of the universe and given a place of security and grandeur within the people of faith that he said, I've got to buy the whole of this scroll of Isaiah. I've got to read the whole thing. And as he read the whole thing, he got stuck on chapter 53. He couldn't make sense of it. Now, we don't know if this happened. That's just my retelling of the story. But I think Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, when talking about a eunuch reading Isaiah 53, expects us, who hopefully know the book of Isaiah, to join some of what happens in Isaiah 56. You see, Isaiah 53 teaches us that we're saved not by works, but by the work of God on our behalf through his suffering servant. That we are saved not because we are of a certain race, or a certain colour, or have attained a certain level of moral merit. We are saved by the free grace of God as his suffering servant takes the punishment we all deserve. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, Philip read, and was deprived of justice. Why? Well, as Philip read, uh, sorry, the you and Philip read Isaiah 53, it talks about his descendants being many all tribes, all tongues, all languages, all nations, a new community of equals. Isaiah 53 tells us the gospel of free grace, and it stripped Philip of all racial haughtiness and hostility and humbled him out of any self-righteousness regarding his sexuality. At the foot of the cross, everyone is equally humbled, and equally exalted. And so one of the implications of the gospel and one of the reasons it's so powerful, whether to this black eunuch in the first century or those who struggle today around issues of race and sexuality is that no matter what your background, no matter what your skin color, no matter what your race, you're welcomed as equals into the family of God through faith in Christ. There's nothing like this gospel. And no matter what your sexual past, no matter what your sexual identity, no matter what the state of your genitalia, you can be given a name that is better than sons and daughters, a name that will endure forever. This is our gospel. This is its power. Philip knew it. He was convicted by it. 
and his conviction gave him a focus, a readiness. He was ready to share the gospel to anyone. He had to go to the ends of the earth with it. Friends, we will never be ready to share the gospel unless we are convicted of its power and know that there's no other message, there's no other person than Jesus that has this kind of power to change lives. The Apostle Paul put it like this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. We won't be ready for evangelism if we're not personally convicted of this. So Paul later goes on to say, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Talking about people that don't know Jesus. And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Philip knew that people cannot be saved unless they believe in Jesus. And they cannot believe in him unless they hear about him. And they cannot hear about him unless someone is sent. And Philip knew God was sending him to one man in a desert. The American TV celebrity and atheist, Penn Juliet, once said this. I've always said I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there is a heaven and a hell, and that people could be going to hell, or not getting eternal life, or whatever, and you think that, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. How much do you have to hate someone, somebody, to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them? People cannot be saved unless they hear the message of the gospel. We must be convicted of it. If not, we'll never be as flexible and as courageous as Philip. So let me reflect to finish on a few of the tactics around evangelism that I think are important that Philip teaches us. We're available, we're ready in our conviction of its power. So what do we actually do? What does evangelism look like? Well, first, let's learn a few lessons from Philip. Firstly, he starts with a question. Do you see that verse 30? Do you understand what you're reading? We must start with questions. To understand the mindset, the worldview, the fears, the objections, the hopes, the doubts, the criticisms of Christianity that someone has that we might be engaging with one-to-one. -one. In one-to-one -one evangelism, we mustn't start by telling them what we know. We must start by finding out what they think and they feel. Only then will we be available to share the gospel to them relevantly. And I think this is the tactical skill for evangelism today, knowing how to ask questions and listen well, to respect what our unbelieving friends say, to be sympathetic of their objections to the Christian faith, to look to find common ground on which to build. Secondly, Philip starts with the question, but he ends with Jesus, doesn't he? Verse 35, then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Not many of us will be gifted by God, I don't think, with the opportunity to stumble across someone reading the book of Isaiah and that would be, oh, can you tell me what it means? Okay, but we'll, we'll have a question or there'll be a doubt or there'll be something that gives us a starting point. And we start where the person is at, but we're not here to teach self-help. We're not here for a personal improvement plan. We're not here to find your inner peace. We're not here for any of those other tactics that the world has and we hear about all the time. We're here to tell people about Jesus. And our gospel is about Jesus. At the end of the day, we have at some point got to get to telling people about Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And that leads us to the next point. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, what did Philip do? He used the Bible. He explained from that very passage and went on and probably shared other parts of scriptures that helped us understand who Jesus is. What we believe about Jesus, we believe because we're told in the Bible. We cannot see people converted, therefore, without using the Bible. We're not offering some spiritual advice or a personal opinion. And we're not even, as powerful as it was, say, when Audrey told her story, we're not even just offering a personal testimony, although that is maybe a, all, they might all be great starting points. When we end with Jesus, we end up having to end with the Bible, don't we? It's in the Bible we discover the good news about Jesus and nowhere else. 
If people cannot accept the authority of the Bible, then how will they accept the authority of Jesus and call him Lord? He might be their saviour, but is he their Lord? And so finally, this brings us on to the last point for evangelism. Philip clearly talked about the cost of being a Jesus follower because the man requests to be baptised. The message of the book of Acts, the, 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 the Christians in the book of Acts is repent and be baptised. Repent, turn from your sins and your current way of life to Jesus and his way of life. This isn't just believe the message and you'll be saved. Even the demons believe. Demons believe Jesus is Lord. They don't submit to him as Lord. That's the difference. Baptism is about submission, obedience, surrender, repentance, self-denial. Much of what we often think of people coming to Christ, like make a decision, pray the prayer, come down the front. They can be good and useful and important. But if our message is just pray and receive, invite Jesus into your heart, that's not doing evangelism as they did in the book of Acts. We must talk at some point to people about surrendering all of their lives to the Lordship of Christ. Turning from sin, turning to in obedience to Jesus and his ways, regardless of how I feel, he's now my Lord. That is what baptism means. We have to talk to our friends about the cost of being a Christian. Isn't this great? Back in the first century, it's, no more, it's just as relevant today. Start with a question. End with Jesus. Use your Bible. Make sure we talk about the cost. What a wonderful passage this is for us. As we think about our role in sharing the message of Jesus with our friends and family and co-workers and neighbours. The Holy Spirit wants to give us power to be available and ready to be used by God for evangelism. One person put it like this, which I really, really liked. They said, Philip was flexibly in touch with the Spirit, was firmly in touch with the Gospel, and was fondly in touch with people. I find that so helpful. I pray that I would increasingly have those three things. I, I pray that our church would have those three things in increasing measure. I wonder as I finish today, which of those three most challenges or most encourages you maybe to be flexibly in touch with the spirit when it comes to sharing the gospel, to be firmly in touch with the gospel, convicted of its power, or to be fondly in touch with people listening and engaging and starting where they are at. Compassionate curiosity with questions to engage them. Brothers and sisters, we have a commission and we have an obligation to make Jesus known to all the nations of the earth. Let's not give up. Let's keep sharing. Let's keep learning. Let's keep building relationships. Let's keep being bold. Because if even one person in a desert is converted that we never see again, it will be worth it. What price can you put on one person's souls? Don't give up. Keep being available. Keep praying. Keep going. Jesus said the gospel had to go to the ends of the earth and then he would return. Let's play our part in his great commission. I want you to imagine the moment when you get to heaven. And there is your friend, your family member, your colleague, your neighbour. And humanly speaking, they wouldn't have been there if you hadn't shared the gospel with them. What joy will be ours on that day? Keep going. Don't give up. Let's pray. Father, as uh, I think it was Andrew prayed earlier, we just long that these inspiring stories of Philip, of Stephen, of the other Christians in the early church would inspire us, that you'd fill us with that level of conviction around the gospel, that level of sensitivity to your Holy Spirit, and that level of love for those around us, that we would naturally gossip the gospel. Lord, that you'd make us sensitive, we'd learn to ask questions, we'd, we'd, we'd make sure we get to Jesus, we're not offering just some self-help. But Lord, that you would open many doors and even in these challenging times that we see opportunities that you're giving us for the gospel. I pray, Lord, as a church, empower us by your spirit to be available and ready to share the good news with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Take my life and let him be
be consecrated, Lord, to me. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages Take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. And here am I, oh me take my life so for thee take my will and make it thine it shall be no longer mine take my heart it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at feet its treasure store. Take my son, I will ever be, ever. Respond as a way of saying, Lord, here I am, all of me, for all that you call me to, to wherever you come. Here am I, all of me. Take my Isaiah receives forgiveness. His response, he hears the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. 
Lord, as we receive your forgiveness, Lord, we, we confess our apathy, uh, the fact that an atheist can, can see the, the need um, and the responsibility to share your gospel, and yet we are often so uh, falling short and so weak and so apathetic. So forgive us our apathy. Forgive us our, our, our patience, our too much patience, thinking there'll be another time, there'll be another chance. Um, our lack of willingness, our lack of availability, our lack of readiness. And we say, Lord, we need your spirit to move us, to change us. We need your angels to minister to us and to lead us and guide us. We need, we need uh, the faith of Philip. And I pray that by your spirit, we will do those things. That when you ask us who will go, we will be putting our hands in the air and saying, here am I, send me. The harvest is plenty and the workers are few. You tell us in the Bible. And so send us out as your workers, Lord Jesus, to bring your gospel to the many who don't know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us today in this service. Uh, I hope you found it challenging and encouraging as well. I know I have. Um, just as a quick reminder, we have breakout rooms at the end of every service where you can uh, just get together with a few people, have, have some chats if you maybe uh, know people and you've been here for ages and you can have catch-ups or if maybe you're new and you don't know anyone and would just like to talk to a, a person instead of just looking at a screen and typing in the chat. Yeah, so do join us for those. Uh, we've also got the separate Zoom again. Um, uh, and maybe we could put the Zoom link in the chat again, or it's just a little bit further up if you scroll up. Uh, so uh, to say goodbye to Ben and Yvonne, we've got the prayer and worship night and, uh, and also, yeah, contacting Vanessa about serving in-person services coming up soon. So exciting. Uh, it would be so great to see people in person and give you a distant hug, <laughs> an elbow bump, maybe. So thanks again for coming and uh, see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.